My name is Arvind Drubengun. I'm here this morning on behalf of our consistory, uh, the church board. And October, uh, many of you realize, is Pastor Appreciation Month. And this morning, we wanted to take the opportunity to uh, express our appreciation to our pastors, Pastor Russell, Pastor Jay. Uh, but also this year, uh, they requested that we also uh, extend this appreciation to the entire paid church staff. And uh, we have done that. Uh, in a small way through a gift for, for our staff uh, previously and for our pastors. Uh, but this morning, we also want to take this opportunity to, to publicly recognize them and show our appreciation. So if there are staff members that are here that could stand at this time, at this service, uh, we do want you to um, talk to them individually and thank them for what they do for Hope Church. But then at this time, if you join me in showing our appreciation. So yeah, I often say that um, really your greatest gift to me as your pastor is the staff, that um, the opportunity to work with Jay, and, and that was Eric, our worship leader, and Scott, who's our facilities manager. They're the ones in the room at the moment. Um, Kim is running around helping get ready. You just met her for uh, Sunday school. Ray is visiting family this weekend, and um, Lori will probably be here at second service, and that's everybody, right, of our day-to-day -day staff. And then we have, you know, Greg Meter, who helps uh, as our treasurer, and Aaron Stevens, who is helping coordinate nursery and that sort of thing. But uh, really, uh, it's, it's, it's a gift. As a pastor who came from a church where I was the staff, um, your, your, your gift to me is the, that this team that I get to work with, and we just do really appreciate it. Yeah, it is a fun staff to be a part of. We have a great time at staff meetings now. We've uh, decided to eat during staff meetings, so that's been a, a positive. We went to so uh, Tuesday lunch. We're we're busy. <laughs> there you go. We actually went and had huge burritos uh, last week as uh, uh, down there by the little uh, taco place or whatever that Ernie and Marlene suggested. The, so the Mexican grocery here in town. I did not know about this until this week. Uh, there's a kitchen in there, and it is good. And he couldn't even finish it, so no, that was kind of quite burrito. a deal. So, um, but do, we do thank you uh, as a congregation. It's fun to be appreciated uh, by you and uh, uh, all the kind words that you say throughout the year and support us as uh, we pastor this church. And uh, um, we just uh, can't say uh, thanks enough. And so thanks again for uh, the honor to be your pastor here at uh, Hope Church.
While you're standing, why don't we still jo uh, join in prayer here? Uh, Lord, we do thank you for those who have been called uh, to ministry and ministry here at, at Hope Church through their various callings and abilities and gifts that you've given them and their willingness to serve in this regard to help coordinate and lead and guide the different programs and activities that we have here and then that we're able to uh, participate in our own individual involvements. We pray that you'll continue to, to bless our staff and in their, their uh, thoughts and the decisions that they make. Uh, bring unity among them, we pray, that they can continue to work forward in your service in a way that's beneficial to uh, our community here and the world around. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Um, thank you, Arv. At this time, we're going to continue to worship through the giving of our offerings. This is how we uh, support the ministry of the church here. This is actually how you pay our salaries. So, um, But if you're a guest today, you're under no obligation to give. Uh, your presence is your gift to us. This is for those who consider themselves to be a part of Hope Church to support the ministry we do. And um, we do appreciate if you would uh, pick up the friendship pads, one end or another of your row or at the table back there. If you fill those out and pass those on to the folks next to you, we do appreciate that as a record of your time with us. And while the offering's being taken, the last couple of weeks we've been showing some God stories. We've been calling them the open door effect. Just some God stories of people who've um, connected to us as a church in the last three years. And so this story um, is an interview uh, that I did with uh, my friend Kyle Norris. So, Kyle, um, just tell me a little bit about your church experience prior to coming to Hope Church. Uh, I was raised in Spencer, and uh, my mom and dad did a great job raising me. They, we went to church. Uh, um, my experience at church was more of a teach you how to not be guilty rather than teach you about Jesus Christ. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't fun. After I graduated high school, I, until I joined here, I really hadn't gone to church. Peter and I decided that it was probably time to start going to church, and she didn't want to go to where I grew up, and uh, we decided to go church shopping. And uh, I said, well, I don't know much about Hope, but I know Pastor Russell, he spoke at Kiwanis a couple times. And uh, I enjoyed what he said, so let's go check him out. And uh, we did, and we never went anywhere else. So it uh, uh, just felt at home here. Well, really going to church, other churches before, just kind of felt like a duty, something you had to do, you weren't getting much out of it, but you had a different feeling when you came to Hope. Yeah, um, I think, the way I look at it is, uh, they were trying to tell me what's in the Bible. When I came here, you were trying to teach me what's in the Bible. Big difference, big difference in the point of view. From the first time I, I came, uh, it just sparked an interest in uh, wanting to learn what's in the Bible. And uh, someone gave me a Bible for our wedding. <laughs> and uh, I picked it up shortly thereafter and just started reading it. And I think I read it once in about five months, about, just about through the Old Testament again, and uh, just keep going. I read it once, I read it more like a history book than anything else, just to get familiar with it, but the second time things are starting to fit together a little bit, and um, seeing things that I didn't see before. Um, yeah, it, uh, it's actually relaxing to read the Bible. And you got hooked up um, with a couple Bible studies. Yeah. I, I don't know if we should call ours a Bible study, but <laughs> you come on Friday morning, we have a little leadership group. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. It's, yeah, it isn't a Bible study. It's more of a business study, but yeah. uh, we pray. Um, and let's see, last January I was at a retreat and met a lot of nice people. Um, got invited to a Bible study here, 
and uh, some of the guys uh, were talking to us about uh, the Brothers in Blue uh, prison ministry mm -hmm. and uh, kind of seemed interested in that and met Scott Finneran and uh, Scott invited me to the aftercare team at Atlas and uh, really didn't take a lot of coaxing to get me there. We met with some guys from Fort Dodge, Des Moines, um, and they all seem to think there's a need for a transition house for prisoners when they come out so they don't have to uh, go straight into the workforce and find a place to live. Um, it's very stressful, very lonely. 12 months ago, I didn't even know any of this existed. But uh, I was led by God to uh, work with these people and help them anyway again. Saw this in, in just under two years. Yeah. Didn't quite anticipate all of this happening, but it, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, and the Bible study gives me strength. The church gives me strength. Helping the ex-mates gives me strength, um, gives me peace. Um, Hope Church is, uh, well, from the first time I walked in, it felt like family. Um, it uh, feels like family and home. So uh, this is Paul Vanderberg, and uh, Paul and Gary Zutenhorst have been co-chairing our Open Doors 2.0 campaign that we've been working on. Gary, or Paul, Paul, I have an envelope here that says it's for Paul Vanderberg. Do not open until October 18. So that's today. Very well, thank you. On Thursday evening, the Greater Consistory and people that uh, support our Hope Reformed Church mission here met, and each of them uh, made a pledge, a pre-pledge into our campaign. And this pledge now will be exposed to us in the amount then that uh, has been raised. So I'm anxious to open this. It is October 18th. Yeah, right? It is October 18th, so you can open that now. Forty-one pledges were received on Thursday night, and the total amount received was $261,000. Praise God. Yeah. Now, so, Pastor Russell, would you share a little bit how we'll be using the entire pledge money? Yeah, and one of the things we've uh, talked about when we, uh, uh, when we raise money as a church, when you give money to the church. One of the things we commit to do is also sharing that money mission-wise. And so uh, we've talked about uh, having missions connected to this Open Doors campaign. Um, but until last Thursday, a week ago Thursday, uh, when the consistory met, we didn't know what projects we were going to designate that mission portion of our offering to. But now we know. And so we wanted to share that with you, the church. So um, three things that we want to direct the missions portion of this uh, capital campaign Towards. One is in Haiti, uh, United Christians International in Haiti. Um, this is something three years ago when we did our campaign. Uh, John, John and Christy Montpremier, many of you know who they are. Um, they, uh, they are United Christians International in Haiti. And one of the things, among other things that they do, is they have an elementary school um, on their property, on their compound. And three years ago, we put a second level on their elementary school. They started out with one floor. Um, we raised enough money to put a second floor on. Now, three years later, they have enough enrollment that they need a second elementary school building, and they now need a middle school. And so um, one of the things we want to direct our mission's money towards is helping them build those additional classrooms. Um, then another thing, kind of a new project for us, Rick and... Steph Peterson, our missionaries we've been supporting in Central Asia. One of the things we feel like God is doing with us as a church is directing our attention towards Central Asia. And Rick was here earlier this month, and he shared um, this is a downtown street of, of the town where they're doing ministry. This is a closed country. It's a Muslim country where um, their church, um, a very small ethnic church that they are working with, is of about 20 to 25 believers is the only church presence in an uh, urban population of over a million people. 25 Christians and over a million people. 
Um, but this is a very busy city street, and um, what they're talking about is along the side here, um, there are office spaces for rent, or not for rent, for purchase, and they're going to purchase an office space and create a Christian information center. Um, if they present it as an educational opportunity and invite um, people to come in and learn about Jesus, the government is okay with that, and, and people can do that without fear of repercussion. And so sort of like a Christian reading room and a place where they can hold discussions. And uh, so we want to designate money uh, that we raise to, to help them purchase that office. And then finally, here in northwest Iowa, something we've been a part of for a long time is Inspiration Hills. It's a Christian camp and retreat center over near Inwood, Iowa. And and they are also beginning a capital campaign to build a new gymnasium. Uh, they host sports teams uh, from around the region, do sports camps and that sort of thing. And um, so we want to designate a portion of the money we raise to that. So that Thursday night, that is tremendous pledge already that gets us nearly halfway to our stated goal of just over 600000 So we thank those leaders who came Thursday and, and helped get us started and want to encourage you all um, to be here next Sunday because we will all be making pledges then and hopefully can get really close or even surpass that goal. Yes, the packets were handed out on October 4, and uh, next week we'll have an opportunity to gather those and to complete our pledges and uh, watch uh, Open Doors 2.0 carry through. Thank you for your support. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you for your work. You need to bring that envelope back second service and act surprised when you open it at the second service, too. Yeah. So it was the summer of 1994. That was the first summer of Beth and my marriage. I was working nights in a school supply warehouse. She was doing food service at a nursing home, taking summer classes. It was a hot summer day, and so we decided we would take in a matinee, and the movie we chose was Speed. I still vividly remember walking out of the movie that day, blinking in the bright sunlight and thinking to myself, that was the most exciting thing I ever saw. Now, sadly, that was 21 years ago. This movie is older than many of you. Um, many of you have possibly never even seen this classic film. Um, don't worry, I'm here to help. <laughs> Speed is a highly improbable movie in which a bad guy played with scenery-chewing relish by Dennis Hopper plants a bomb on the bottom of a Los Angeles city transit bus, wires it in such a way that once the bus goes 50 miles an hour, it is armed, and if the bus ever goes slower than 50 miles an hour, the bomb goes boom. Sandra Bullock plays a frazzled young woman who ends up driving the bus, and Keanu Reeves is the hotshot Los Angeles policeman who has to find a way to disarm the bomb. Um, at the end of the movie, they become a couple, even though they both understand that relationships that begin under intense circumstances rarely work out, which is apparently the case because when Speed 2 rolls around, this time on a cruise ship, um, Sandra's all by herself. There's no Keanu Reeves to be seen. I prefer to believe that Speed 2 never happened. I don't want to live in a world in which Jack and Annie are not happy together forever. <laughs> anyway... The action in speed occurs as this transit bus is forced to travel down busy streets and congested freeways in Los Angeles without slowing down. At one point, it even jumps over an incomplete overpass, which totally could have happened. <laughs> At another point, it's forced to go down a road in a wrong direction. And, and, and there are barricades, black and yellow gates, which are there supposedly to restrict access that this bus simply obliterates. A toll collector's gate is no match for a speeding city bus with a bomb strapped to its belly. And it's that picture of a wooden gate splintering into a thousand pieces before an irresistible force. It's that picture that occurs to me as Jesus states his goal for his church. Jesus gives us his goal for the church in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, I know this is a strange metaphor. It's just a strange image I've just planted in your mind, but bear with me. Jesus' aim for the church is that it's smashed through the forces of evil 
like a runaway bus. So Matthew 16, 18 is going to be the key verse for our message today. But, but let's go back to when Jesus first uttered these words so we have some understanding of the context. Uh, Jesus and his disciples are walking through an area known as Caesarea Philippi, which was sort of a Roman colony, a, a place where the Romans had sort of settled in the midst of Israel. And so there were all kinds of pagan shrines shrines to pagan gods in this area and as as they're walking through and you can imagine jesus kind of looking at these shrines to these different gods he he turns to his disciples and he says who do people say that i am you know who, who, who do people think that the son of man is what are what are they saying jesus says you know what's the word on the street you know people are talking about me but but what is it that they're saying about me and the disciples answers are interesting Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Everybody they name is dead. There's obviously a fascination uh, out among the public with the supernatural in Jesus' life, right? They don't have a category in which they can place Jesus. He's doing these healings, he's, he's saying these profound things. So they don't have a category in which to place him. So they can only imagine that God must have brought one of these famous prophets of the Old Testament back to life. And it's remarkable how they're so close to the truth, and yet at the same time so, so far wrong. But Jesus isn't really interested in the watering hole gossip. What he really wants to know is who these guys think he is, the disciples, the ones who've been spending all of this time with him. He wonders, who do they say that Jesus is? And Peter, the unofficial leader of the disciples, Peter, who's always so quick to offer an opinion, now answers, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And for once, Peter's impulsivity is right on the mark. He says aloud now what the disciples have probably been whispering about for months on end, that that there's something special about Jesus, something totally different, that he must be the promised one, he must be the Messiah, He, he must be the Son of God. And Jesus blesses Simon Peter for his answer. This isn't something Simon arrived at on his own. You know, he and the other disciples, this is something that's been revealed to them by God. And then comes our key verse, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus says, I will tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, there's been more than a little controversy around this verse question is what what exactly does jesus mean when he says on this rock i will build my church for those in the roman catholic church the fact that peter comes from the greek word for rock which is petra that there's an obvious connection between simon being called peter now and and jesus saying on this rock i will build my church for so for those in the catholic church the, the conclusion is that that jesus has now given peter a special authority sort of a um made Peter in charge of both the disciples and the church going forward. And so for Roman Catholicism, they believe that, that the papacy begins here, that, that from Peter onward now there's a direct succession of authority in the church. For those of us on the Protestant side of the aisle, us, we see, obviously, the word play between Peter and the rock. You have to acknowledge that. But we understand Jesus not to be building his church on any one individual, but rather on the truth which Peter has just uttered. Under the Protestant understanding, Jesus is saying that the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the key to the church, and that those who can make this confession are those who belong to him. We just sang that the Apostles' Creed in, in song form, the bridge, we said, I believe in you, I, I believe that you are the Son of God. I think that's what it said, right? But, but the, I believe that Jesus is Lord. If you can utter that, if you can say, I believe that Jesus is Lord, you're echoing what Peter said, and that, that makes you a part of the church. Now, point of the sermon today is not to get into the distinctions between Catholicism and Protestantism, so much as it is for us to see Jesus' ambition for the church here. There are three things in this verse that I want to point out to you that get to what Jesus hopes for and intends for those who believe in him. So first, 
I want you to notice that Jesus says, my church. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. When we're talking about the church, we need to see that Jesus claims ownership. It's his church. It belongs to him. This is something we talked about last week. Jesus owns everything in the world. He owns everything you have, from your boat to your... um, I had three Bs. From your boat to your bank account to your body, okay? He owns it all. It all belongs to him. This is, so, so that's true of you. It's true of what you own. It's also true of the church. It's his church. We're just stewards. We're just managers of it. We all have our roles to play in the church. We talk about in this church picking up your paddle all the time. We all have influence of what happens in the church, but it's never really our church. Not in the sense of possession or ownership. This is one of the hazards of my profession. As a pastor, it's easy for me to start talking about my church. And when I say that, what I should mean, and hopefully what I usually mean, is the church which I'm privileged to be the pastor of, right? But I will admit, sometimes when I say my church, I'm talking about the church that I lead, or, or, or even the church that I'm in charge of, or even sometimes the church that, that I build. But that isn't right. It's never the church that I own. It's always Jesus' church. And as members, we all have to be careful about how we think about the church as well. I mean, you can say, you know, that's my church. It's, it's our church. If what you mean is the, the church that I belong to. But if it becomes our church in the sense of the church which we control or, or, or the church um, that... that, that that we make decisions for, that are the church that belongs to us, then we're taking from Jesus what can only belong to him. Sometimes when you've helped start a ministry, or, or you've given a lot of money, or, or you've served in a leadership capacity, you can start thinking that you have some sort of ownership right over the church. Like I said, I'm vulnerable to slipping into that way of thinking a lot, but we all need to remember it's always his church. And the church Jesus is talking about here, of course, is the church universal, what I sometimes call the church with a capital C. He's talking uh, about the collection of people all over the world who confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus is talking about everyone everywhere who will be redeemed by the cross. He's saying they all belong to him. But what he says about the big church, the church universal, also applies to the local church. Every individual congregation which confesses the name of Jesus is his church. This is his church. And I'm not just talking about the building. I'm talking about every single one of us who practices our faith within this community, our expressions of worship, our collective mission, our identity as a body of Christ. It all belongs to him. It's his church. So second, I want you to notice that Jesus says, I will build. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. When we're talking about the church, we need to see that Jesus claims responsibility. It's his church, and he will take responsibility for building it. This is so important to keep in mind, especially when we see a church struggling. You know, when waves of persecution drive the church out of an entire nation, as is happening in Syria and Lebanon right now, the news reports say that for all intents and purposes, Lebanon no longer has a functioning church within its borders because of the persecution that's happening there. And it can be so discouraging to see the church losing ground like that. Or or, or when we see scandal or moral failure destroy a high-profile congregation, or we see a really old church decline and decline until eventually it shutters its door, or we see a brand-new church fail to get traction and, and go for a few years and then just sort of disappear, it can feel like the church is falling apart, that we are somehow letting God down. And human failings certainly factor into those situations. But the good news is human effort is not ultimately responsible for building the church. Jesus takes responsibility for building his church. He's not about to let it fail. Individual congregations may wax and wane, but the overall church, again, church with a capital C, is going to go on. Jesus is not going to let his church on earth disappear. 
And this should give us great confidence for those of us who love the church and work in it, whether you work as a paid employee or as a volunteer, should give us great confidence that the success or failure of the church is not ultimately up to us. Christ is going to build his church. He has a mission for his church. He's going to see it carried out. This puts us in a position where we should be willing to take great risks for Jesus. Try new things for the sake of the gospel. Go to difficult places because we know whether our individual efforts succeed or fail, Christ's designs for his church will ultimately prevail. That, the idea is similar to what Jesus is getting at when he gives his disciples the Great Commission in Matthew 28. The Great Commission is when Jesus says to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. Many of you are familiar with that command. But, but right before he says that, right before Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In other words, he says, hey guys, I own it all. It all belongs to me. I'm in charge of it all. And so now you as my followers, you go. You go to the far corners of the earth and, and you teach the gospel and you baptize people in my name and, and I've got your back. The idea is since Jesus is in charge of everything, we can give everything we have to the mission of his church. I want you to notice also the word build. That's an ambitious word. That's an aggressive word. Jesus isn't planning to just maintain or preserve the church. He isn't intending for his disciples and a few close friends to sort of just represent him on earth after he's gone. He wants to build the church. He wants to expand it, to grow it. He intends for the church to be much, much more than it was at that moment in the dusty hills of Caesarea Philippi. He's going to build his church. Which leads to the third thing I want you to notice. Jesus says, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He says, you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. When we're talking about the church, we need to see that Jesus claims victory. It's his church, he's going to build it, and it's going to prevail. And this is good news for the church. This is a bold and magnificent promise. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Hell will not be able to hold back the church. Jesus is saying that he's going to unleash a movement that will be so powerful and so intense that it will be unstoppable. The church is the speeding bus. The gates of hell are the gates smashed into a thousand toothpicks. Now we need to understand what Jesus is saying here. In my imagination, I used to picture this verse as all of these forces of evil and darkness sort of assaulting the church and the church standing up against every attack. I think there are a lot of churches that take this mentality. I call it a fortress mentality. In fact, some churches look like fortresses. A fortress mentality that just sort of says we, we are here to sort of stand against the waves of, of secularism and worldliness and we're, we're going to stand our ground. And Some churches present a very defensive posture. The need to protect the faith against every movement of evil. But that's not the picture Jesus is painting. I mean, there might be a place for that, but that's not what Jesus is talking about in this verse. He's not picturing the gates of heaven standing up to assault from the forces of hell. He's talking about the gates of Hades. The fortress here is hell, and Jesus is talking about his church taking the fight to them. There are places of doubt and death and darkness in the world, and Jesus' plan is for his church to storm the gates. Again, a speeding bus crashing through barriers. Jesus' ambition for the church is that his called out people will be on the offensive, carrying the truth of the gospel to those who have doubt, bringing the hope of his love to those in the midst of death, shining the light into the darkness. Jesus is talking about his church going to the broken cities of Haiti and the oppressive nations of the Middle East and the pre-modern tribes of the South American jungle. He's talking about his church reaching out to the single mom down the street or the recent immigrant to our country or the elderly neighbor who can't do yard work anymore. Jesus is talking about a church that will expand his kingdom, that will take back territory the enemy has claimed. And when we do, he guarantees that the church will win. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. They can't stand up to the force of love and grace and hope and joy that Jesus has let loose in us. So take encouragement. 
If you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ, you're a part of the most powerful, irresistible force in the world. The movement you belong to will push back the darkness, will shine forth His light. Hell doesn't have a chance. So here's the big idea today. Here's the challenge for us. Our ambition for the church should match Jesus' ambition for the church. Our Lord has ambitious plans for His church in this world. We should too. As we've mentioned, we're in the midst of a capital campaign for the church. We started the message today by sharing how much our leaders have already pledged to the campaign. Our our goal is to eliminate debt in the next three years and, and, and support these mission projects. And so this month, we're in the midst of a sermon series I'm calling Run to Win, based on 1 Corinthians 9.24, where Paul tells us to run in such a way as to win the prize. I'm making the argument that we should all be striving to make Hope Church the best church it can be. All of us who consider ourselves to be part of Hope Church should desire to see it be the best representation of Christ's body it can be in its worship, in its preaching, in its children and youth ministries, in its outreach and service to our community, in its prayer and care ministries, in its small groups and body life, in its mission and its witness. We should all desire that Hope Church be the best church it can be. In other words, we should be ambitious for the church. Now let me pause a moment and say something about that word ambition. Because there's a sense in which ambition can be a dirty word, especially among Christians who really value humility and service. You know, the word ambition can conjure up images of power-hungry dictators stab you in the back, corporate climbers. People who are considered ambitious are often thought to be self-promoters, self-serving, just plain selfish Our second president, John Adams, once spoke of the natural passion for distinction that we all have, how every person is strongly actuated by a desire to be seen, heard, talked of, approved of, and respected. That's what we usually associate with ambition. In fact, let me give you an example. Uh, Just this last week, Steve Spurrier retired as the head football coach at the University of South Carolina. And so a couple of articles ran just sort of doing a retrospective on Steve Spurrier's career. And I read that In 1966, the year that Spurrier won the Heisman Trophy as the quarterback of Florida, um, he was playing in a game. They were playing against Auburn. The score was tied 27-27, came down to a last-minute 40-yard field goal that Spurrier insisted he needed to kick. Now, he was a quarterback, not a kicker. Hadn't practiced place kicking all season, but he insisted he was the star of the team. He was going to go out there, and he was going to kick that final field goal. He made it. Um, Florida won, but that's sort of the picture I have when I think of what it means to be an ambitious person. Big ego, you know, self-promoting, self-driven. But ambition's not the problem. Ambition is not necessarily a bad thing. It's more a question of what are you ambitious for? I have in my office a book called Rescuing Ambition by Dave Harvey. And he makes the case that ambition, godly ambition that is, is a noble force for the glory of God. He quotes J. Oswald Sanders who says, Ambition that centers on the glory of God and the welfare of the church is a mighty force for good. There's nothing wrong with ambition so long as we're ambitious for the right thing. And if you're a Christ follower, then your ambition should match up with your Lord's. As we've seen, our Lord is ambitious for the church. It's His church. He promises to build it. He wants it to storm the gates of hell and shine His light into the midst of darkness. So when we talk about helping Hope Church to be the best church it can be, I think that ties in directly to our Lord's ambition for us. He doesn't want us to be a church that settles for the way things have always been done. He doesn't want us to be a church that says, well, things are good enough as they are. He doesn't want us to be a church that is content with what we have, with the number of people who attend, with the impact we're having. He doesn't want us to be a church that hunkers down and keeps the world at bay. He wants us to be a church on a mission. A church which is actively storming the gates of hell. A church that is always seeking to build his kingdom. So allow me to wrap up by doing a little bit of application, just real quick. How does this make a difference for you? 
there's three things I'd like to ask of you. Three things. First, I'd, I'd like to ask you to love the church. Jesus loves and cherishes the church. It's his church. It's made up of the people he's called out and redeemed. So shouldn't we love what he loves? Shouldn't we share his passion for the church? And part of loving the church then means being committed to the church. One of the truths we must reckon with is that a prevailing church like Jesus describes in Matthew 16 is going to be a church that changes over time. Those of you who have been a part of this church for 40, 30, even 20 years, you know this isn't the same church it was when you joined. I mean, the building's changed. One obvious distinction. The worship styles have changed over the years. The, the programming and, and things like that have changed. Now, hopefully the commitment to love Jesus and, and to preach his word, maybe hopefully that's the same or, or maybe even deeper than it was years ago. But, but in a lot of different superficial ways, this church has changed. And I can promise you it's going to change in the future. A year from now, a year from today, this church probably isn't going to look the same as it does right now. I guarantee you five years from now it'll be different. Some of the changes you might like. Some of the changes you might not like. But I'm asking you to love the church that Jesus loves. Stay committed. Dave Harvey puts it like this. He says, my church is a much different in size and feel than when I first came. Same gospel, but different programs, different needs, different priorities. Challenges and changes like this should not constitute an automatic call from God to leave. Love your church. Stay committed to it. Second, pray for the church. Jesus takes responsibility for the church. He promises to build it. Ultimately, the success of our church is up to him. So we should be praying to him for our church. We should be lifting Hope Church up in prayer to him. Ask him to be building us into the church he wants us to be. This may sound self-serving. I don't mean it to be. But, but, but can I ask you to pray for me? Pray for me and, and the rest of the church staff. I, I mean, you just appreciated us and, and you thanked us. And, and, and your thanks is nice. But really what you can do for us is you can pray for us. Pray for programs like our youth group and our children's ministry. Pray for outreach events like Trunk or Treat. Come early on Sunday morning. Go to the Grace Room and pray for God to speak during this service. Come before the second service. Meet in Ray's office. Pray for that service. Jesus is responsible to build the church, so let's ask him to do just that. And then third, serve the church. Jesus is ambitious for his church to storm the gates of Hades. So what are you doing to help the church do just that? Recognizing that Christ is the master builder, are we helping to build the kind of church he wants? Harvey again, I'll let him have the last word. He says, there are a lot of good things Christians can build. Good families, good businesses, good reputations, good houses, good memories, good lifestyle. But there's nothing better to set your ambitions to than building a good church. So does your involvement in your church contribute to its welfare? Do you help strengthen your church, or are you just another body that shows up on Sunday mornings? Is Sunday morning the day you get to gather with God's people to celebrate what he's doing and to hear what he's saying? Or is Sunday morning the day you get to get up too early, drive too far, sit too long, hear too much, then try to make it back home before the game kicks off or before the meat overcooks? The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth in our world, the center of God's redemptive activity. It's the one human institution that will shine brightly throughout eternity. So if we're going to build, let's build the church. Let's pray. Jesus, we do give you thanks for your church, and it is your church. It's a church many of us are privileged to be a part of, to call, um, our church in the sense of the church we belong to, but we recognize it's yours. We thank you, Lord, for your promise to build it. We thank you that you promise that it will overcome, that it will prevail, that nothing we give to the church will be wasted then in that respect, um, nothing that we do or risk um, will be lost because your plan for the church, Lord, is that it would storm the gates of darkness in our world and 
and obliterate it. And we want to be a part of that. We want Hope Church to be part of that. We want Hope Church to be the best church it can be. So Lord, help each of us to find our place to serve. Help us to be fervent in our prayers. Lord, deepen our love um, for the church that you love. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. That was a really good song for this service there. Uh, that The second verse talking about God performing his work through those who are weak. That's us. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not the strongest group. We're not the best looking group of people in the world. You know, we're, we're not the smartest group of people in the world. But what we have is we have Jesus. You know, and he's the one who promises to build his church. And he's the one who promises to work through us. He wants to use us. Whatever we are, wherever we're at, whatever we have to offer, he wants to take what we have and use it. And he promises, he promises that the gates of hell will not overcome what he's going to do with his church. So what a great privilege for us to be a part of that. And, um, what a great privilege to be a part of this group, um, despite our flaws. Uh, as you go, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.